All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the next talk today. I hope you're having a good day so far. I've seen some interesting talks. All right, just a couple of things. Remember to stay hydrated. Uh, be sure to keep your mask on. We appreciate you wearing them all the time. You know, it makes it much easier for all of us. And uh, you know, thank you from the conference itself for that. Uh, we have a fourth track. You've probably seen it floating around somewhere. If you're interested in giving a talk or presentation and you aren't scheduled for one, you can go to the info desk and you can ask. And there's some slots in the coffee, shop, coffee house where you can go and give you know, 15 or 20 minute presentations. So after, after seeing all these wonderful presentations, you feel inspired, head down there and sign up. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, there is uh, Hackers Got Talent tonight. So hopefully some of you have some great talent and you're willing to go sign up and participate in that. So hope, hope to see you there. So today's talk is about MRI machines and how they work. And our presenter is Doug Branter. And with that, Doug is, uh, presenting via Zoom. So you won't see his face today, you'll see his talk. If you have questions, we're gonna have a Q&A period. You can either submit them through the Matrix chat for this channel, or you can let me know and I will read them in because he can't hear you, or you in the audience. So with that, with no further ado, off to Doug. Um, hi, uh, my name is Doug Brantner, um, and this is how does an MRI machine work. Um, um, so just a quick warning, um, we're going to see some medical images, we're going to talk about health and diseases, and talk about hospital and medical equipment, but nothing too graphic, it should be safe for all ages. Um, I might talk fast because I have a lot to cover. Um, I have no personal financial interest to disclose related to this talk, um, that's something they make you say before uh, medical conferences, um, and the views in this talk do not represent those of my employer or the open source imaging project. Um, most of this talk is disclaimers, um, I am not a doctor, I'm not an MRI technician, or an MRI safety expert, or a medical physicist. Um, if you have any questions related to health or interventions, I cannot answer those. Um, so you should seek a licensed doctor or a medical technician or uh, all of the above, um, because I've only been doing this for two years um, and I'm not there yet. Um, so I am an MRI research engineer. Um, I work on so sensors for motion correction um, and motion phantoms. A phantom is any uh, test object that is not a person that you put in the MRI uh, for testing. Um, and I also work on uh, uh, simulations and body models. Um, I have a master's in scientific computing, which is half math and computer science. Um, I like to say I have a, a master's degree in floating point errors. Um, I did my thesis in computer vision. Um, this is solving uh, stereo uh, distances from stereo images um, and a little bit of machine learning. Um, I went back to school. I used to work on movies. Um, this is where I used to work. Um, this is my office. Um, this is the view from my office. Um, I was in this one. Um, and this is the first science lab that I ever worked on, if anyone recognizes that. Um, and I've been a HOPE volunteer since 2010. Um, shout out to the AV crew and the streaming crew. Um, sorry I can't be there this year. Um, uh, so a little bit uh, quick thank yous. Um, thanks to HOPE in 2600. Um, there was a talk at my first HOPE in 2010 called, uh, on hacking the education system. And that kind of put the bug in my head to go back to school. Um, and none of this would have happened without like the open source community and the hacker community. Um, and a uh, double thank you to the Adafruit uh, Jobs Board uh, for uh, finding my last two jobs for me. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna leave these up here. Uh, I don't think I have enough time to go into them, but uh, a little bit on back to school, you can go back and pause the video if you're interested. Um, uh, Um, so I work on motion sensors for MRI um, because motion in MRI is a huge problem and it causes all kinds of uh, artifacts in the images or just messes up the images. Um, anything from bulk motion of your body uh, to respiratory motion from breathing or even your heartbeat can mess it up. Um, and basically there's not much you can do about it except for repeating the scan and MRI is pretty slow so it takes a lot of time so that is not an ideal uh, solution. Um, there's a lot of effort going into motion correction um, and the current methods, there's like one sensor where they put a, a pneumatic belt around you um, and it's supposed to uh, help with uh, what they call respiratory gating, um, but the, it doesn't work very well and it's very cumbersome. So we're looking for better solutions. Um, so this is a, a poster we submitted to a, an MRI conference this year. Um, this is a 3D uh, USB camera um, that can take videos and we basically put it in some copper pipe with some conductive glass for shielding. Um, and stuck it in the MRI and we were able to get a uh, respiratory motion. Um, this you have to be very careful because of the magnet. Um, there's a lot of safety testing that happens before this, so um, don't try this at home. Um, and one thing that's kind of interesting is that uh, the MRI, the, the magnetic field 
uh, increases very quickly as you approach the MRI. Um, and if you move any conductive object, um, obviously you can't use any, uh, mag any metal or magnetic objects. So we use copper because it's not magnetic. Um, but if you move any conductor, it induces a current and you can burn things out just by moving around in the MRI room. Um, so one of the cameras actually burned out just from moving it into the MRI too quickly. So you have to be really careful. Um, another cool thing about MRI, these are um, uh, headphones uh, for hearing protection and you'll see there's an air tube. Um, so they pipe the sound in uh, using an air tube um, because you want to avoid uh, conductors in the MRI if at all possible, because uh, they can heat up and cause burns if they're not uh, handled properly. Um, so we want to show that our sensors don't interfere with the MRI. So SNR or signal to noise ratio is a huge uh, factor in MRI. Um, and we want to make sure that we're not uh, negatively affecting the SNR of the scanner. And we show before and after um, without the camera and with the camera, and it's pretty comparable. And uh, the MRI signal is entirely uh, radio frequency. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not causing any RF interference in the scanner too. So this is the baseline. Um, it has a funny shape, but that's normal. Um, and this is um, with the camera operating. And you see a spike in the noise frequency uh, in, in one or two frequencies. Um, but typically, uh, the MRI only cares about the center. So these you know, may, or may, may, may or may not be tolerable depending on uh, the type of imaging you're doing. Um, and you know, we could definitely improve the shielding as well. Um, so this is the respiratory waveform. I think if this is a video, yeah. Um, so this is a video of someone in the scanner breathing and you can see we can track the motion quite nicely. Um, it's also kind of interesting. You can see the buttons in their shirt. Um, it's, uh, the buttons actually go the wrong way though, uh, probably due to diffraction. Um, so that's something that we should look into further. Um, but this is a pretty promising uh, for motion tracking. And this, you know, we could either feed the signal into the scanner uh, and do real-time motion correction, or you can do retrospective motion correction um, and post-processing. Um, so uh, last year, the year before, um, this is my colleague's work. Um, we used an accelerometer. Um, this might look familiar to some people. Um, we use an accelerometer which measures acceleration. Um, and we use that as a proxy for motion. Um, and then we use the wireless motion, uh, microcontroller. And uh, we found a non-magnetic battery. Um, so we could transmit uh, real-time uh, motion signals uh, to a Raspberry Pi over Wi-Fi. So this one's also wireless, which is kind of cool. And that's really important, um, again, because of the heating uh, um, uh, and wire, uh, wires can cause heating and cause burns if you're not careful. So wireless is really ideal. Um, and we have to do a lot of uh, magnetic safety testing. So we have to test each part individually before we even go in the room with it um, to make sure it's not magnetic. So even though this has this big metal chunk here, um, it's, it's, it seems to be not magnetic. Um, so we were able to use it in, in the scanner uh, safely. Um, and we also have to do heating testing with the RF um, and make sure that nothing's gonna heat up and cause burns. Um, so we also wanna make sure uh, that we're not gonna mess up the images. Um, so this is a B0 map or a map of the magnetic field that the scanner can take itself. Um, and this one is pretty clean. So you want it to be as even as possible. Um, and this is a water bottle phantom. So, it, um, cause you, uh, most MRI imaging is water. Um, and we put the different test objects on top of it and we see how much they mess up the magnetic field. So even if they're not gonna fly into the scanner, they can still disrupt the, uh, the, the, the homogeneity of the magnetic field. Um, so this one is pretty clean. Um, this, these are two different accelerometers. Um, and this one uh, uh, causes a disturbance in the magnetic field. So it might have, you know, maybe the, the, the coating on the PCB might have like nickel or something in it. So it's not enough to fly into the magnet, but it is enough to disturb the magnetic field. Um, and here we show two different microcontrollers and they both, you know, probably because of this big metal piece, um, they, this one takes a pretty big chunk out of the magnetic field and we can't even get an image there. Um, so I think we wound up, uh, I forget which one we used, but probably this one. Um, and then two different batteries. Um, again, they're both not magnetic, but this one you know, really messes up the magnetic field and this one doesn't. Um, and again, we look at the RF noise too. Um, so in order to test them, uh, we wanna make sure that the MRI is not interfering with our sensors and we're actually getting good signals that, uh, that, are, that are actually useful. Um, so I worked on a motion phantom, uh, which is basically um, a, a stepper motor uh, controller uh, using an Arduino um, that drove a cam to squeeze an airbag. Um, and then we send an air tube uh, through. So this is, um, the MRI is in a Faraday cage um, and we have to be ca very careful um, uh, passing anything through what we call a waveguide, um, which is basically a pipe that, that goes through the cage. Um, and this is to block RF noise from the outside world from interfering with the MRI. 
Um, so we pass an air tube, which is uh, totally safe. And so everything in the MRR room is uh, rubber from the motion phantom. Um, and then we put the sensor box on top of it um, and it transmits the motion data over Wi-Fi uh, to a Raspberry Pi that just barely fit in there. Um, and since the Wi-Fi signal is so far out of our uh, MRI frequency range, um, that it, it, it doesn't really affect the image. Uh, but we might have gotten some low harmonics, which is interesting. Um, so the motor is programmed with a, a, a pre-described waveform, and we, we can compare that against the, the sensor data. Um, but then if we, we, our goal is to measure uh, motion in patients, and we can't program the patients. Um, so my idea, I guess having a film background, was to put a camera. Um, so we use the camera for tracking um, objects that we can't program. Um, and this is a video of that. Um, so this is an in vivo scan, meaning a real live person, a volunteer. Um, we have to do a lot of safety testing. The, the sensor is in a shielded box uh, made of copper, and we have to do heating testing to make sure it's not going to cause burns. And we put it inside a flame-proof pouch anyway, just to be safe. Um, and you could see um, this is comparing the accelerometer signal in blue to the uh, video signal in orange. Um, so we also tried uh, putting the stepper motor in the MRI room. Um, that This is, uh, uh, do not try this at home. Um, and so we, uh, it causes an enormous amount of radio frequency noise. Um, so we put it in a shielded box that was custom made by our machinist. Um, it has a sliding door so we can put the motor in and out. It has a, a shielded DB9 connector, which we use for the motor power. Uh, we wind up uh, replacing a lot of screws with brass screws and stuff like that. Um, and uh, it has a, a waveguide again, which is an open uh, uh, conduit. Um, for the mechanical output, um, so we could put like a shaft or a belt or a string through it um, for the, um, so we can actually get the motion out of the box. <laughs> um, so yeah, do not try this at home. This means it's not safe to use in the MRI room. Um, so do as I say, not as I do. Um, but uh, the, the magnet is actively shielded, so it, the magnetic field actually falls off pretty quickly. Um, so all the way back here, um, there's almost no magnetic pull on the box, but just to be safe, um, we tied some strings to it so that it wouldn't slide because the scanner vibrates while it's on. Um, so this is like, yeah, do not try this at home. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is the baseline uh, RF noise again, uh, radio frequency. Um, and then this is what happens with the, the old cable, which wasn't uh, shielded very well, and it, it really blows up the noise really badly. Um, so we would not get a good picture from this signal. Um, and then with a new cable, with a double shielded uh, twisted pair cable, the twisted pair really helps. Um, and messing around with the, the grounding, um, we got it back down to baseline, which I was like really proud of. Um, and just to make sure it's working, uh, we opened that sliding door and this is what happened. So I think that shows that the shield was actually working. Um, so uh, this is a picture of the motion phantom uh, close up. So the stepper motor driving a cam, um, the airbag and the air tube goes into the MRI room and this is the sensor sitting on top of it. Um, this is a head coil. Um, so the, the MRI signal is um, radio frequency again. Um, and so we need uh, antennas in the MRI to pick it up. And so this is actually full of uh, antennas that would uh, pick up the signal from a head scan. Um, and I don't know if you could see, but this is the water bottle phantom inside. <clears throat> Um, here's a video of the airbag working and the sensor on top of it. And this is the, the signal coming from the sensor uh, over Wi-Fi. Um, this is a Wi-Fi antenna. Um, and then <clears throat> these are the um, signals we presented at the conference. This is the same um, from the video. Um, one thing, uh, the first thing I ever did was uh, I put some Legos in the MRI, which was kind of cool. Um, so I, get, I got paid to play with Legos. Um, the motor cannot go in the MRI. That would not be safe. Um, but you know, wood, uh, brass screws, those are safe. You have to be careful with the cables again. Um, this was a test jig to test a, a linear um, encoder. Um, and I used uh, rubber bands instead of springs and then a string that we could pull uh, that went through the waveguide. Um, so everything is uh, non-conductive except for the, the cables. Um, so MRI. Um, it uses magnets and radio waves. Um, there is no ionizing radiation um, in MRI. Um, so x-rays and CT or CAT scans use radiation um, and MRI does not. So that's one of the major benefits. Um, uh, we're mostly looking at uh, your water molecules, um, which are full of uh, hydrogen protons. Um, the CAT scan, oops, I'm sorry. 
uh, a CAT scan is actually spinning around you really fast and it's, it literally spins the X-ray around you really fast um, to get a 3D picture. Um, and the MRI instead uses uh, changing magnetic fields to get multiple views and that's how we get uh, 3D views. Um, and in this case, uh, this is from those multiple radio coils. So they're each sensitive to a different area and then uh, we combine them at the end to get a, a nice picture and what's called parallel imaging. Um, these are a few other things. So this is, um, you can take an MRI picture at any angle um, and it, they're all cross sections of the inside of the body. So this is an oblique slice or a diagonal slice of the heart. So you get, uh, you can see all four chambers. Um, this is a, a knee in the sagittal view or sideways view. Um, and this is a, a axial view, which is looking in the head foot direction or down the bore of the scanner. Um, and this is like the liver and the spleen. Um, and these are uh, some other images. Um, here you can see a, a, a meniscal tear. Um, these are T2 images and the previous ones were T1 and we'll get to all that later. Um, and then these are, you can, uh, by manipulating the settings on the scanner, uh, like you would with like a manual camera, um, you can get different, you can highlight different tissues or suppress different tissues. So in this case, on the left, uh, this is a fat suppressed image and on the right is a nor uh, regular uh, image. Um, and you can see the, the subdermal fat, but also the bone marrow uh, gets darker um, when you turn on the, the fat suppression. Um, this is... I hope you can hear this. Um, I'm gonna scroll through this actually. Oh, I'm sorry. This was partially a video project. Um, so basically you can scroll through the slices um, and get a 3D view of the body. And this is like how the radiologist would look at it. Um, and you could see like the liver and the spleen and the kidneys and the spine. And you can see the major blood vessels, which is cool. Um, and then you can take the slices in any direction. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, so um, you can kind of think of it as a 3D volume. Um, but the pictures are, are taken in one dominant direction. So one direction is always going to look the best. Um, and you can scroll. Um, you can also turn them into 3D models, which is uh, really interesting. And we actually uh, use these um, for uh, simulations um, from MRI images. Um, and this is also a big topic in um, data set anonymization and patient privacy. Because um, if you can do this, um, you could do it with a face. So you can like scrub all the metadata, but you know, you're, the, there's actually a lot of research going on in what's called defacing MRI images to like completely anonymize the data set in today's world. Um, yeah, and you can scroll through them. Um, so you can select the slices, you can select the orientation of the slices. So this is a, a diagonal slices taken in the brain. So this is uh, 40 slices and they're taken one at a time. Um, and each time, each, each slice takes time to acquire. Um, and that's why motion is such a big problem. Uh, so if you, if, one, uh, each, if you take one slice and then you move your head a little bit, um, then it's gonna, the next slice is not gonna line up or you're gonna get blurring or something like that. Um, this is some COVID-19 lung imaging. Um, you can see uh, some damage in the lungs. Um, and the bottom is a, a comparison with the CAT scan. Um, and you can see the MRI has a lot nicer uh, tissue contrast in the soft tissues. Um, and it doesn't expose you to uh, the ionizing radiation. So that's a huge benefit of uh, MRI. Um, fMRI is kind of interesting. Um, they use uh, oxygen level as a proxy for metabolism. Um, so the, the, you know, are they reading your thoughts? You know, there, there's a lot of research on that right now. Um, and they can also do functional MRI of uh, other body parts like the lungs um, using uh, different uh, concentrations of oxygen. And on top is uh, healthy lungs. And you can see the oxygen perfusion is pretty uh, even throughout the lung. And on the bottom is people with diseased lungs. And you can see the difference. Um, uh, interventional MRI is anything that um, any procedure that's guided by an MRI. So they might put you an MRI and then um, you know, use it for a biopsy or a surgery, or uh, they use uh, MRI to guide radiation therapy to avoid um, damaging nearby tissues. Um, low field MRI or lower magnet strength is a very hot new topic um, because, it, because the magnet is a lower strength, um, it, it opens up a lot of possibilities um, for um, um, uh, 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 stuff you can bring into the MRI room uh, safely. Um, so MRI is very slow. It has a very, li very limited field of view. So you could get a full body CT in less than a minute um, where a full body MRI would probably take, you know, maybe an hour and it would be uh, at least six partial scans 
um, very sensitive to motion. Um, any implants or metal in your body is a hazard potentially. Um, some mo more modern uh, implants are uh, MR conditional, depending on the scanner and the settings. Um, some tattoos um, and makeup pigments actually uh, are contain uh, uh, ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic particles, um, which can heat up an MRI. So you have to be careful with that. Um, patient comfort is not ideal. Um, a lot of people have claustrophobia and the MRI is not a great place for that. Um, I'm kind of hoping with this talk, maybe we can help alleviate some of that and maybe you'll be uh, interested in the, all the technical stuff that's happening around you um, and help with that a little bit. Um, and you can't move, you have to stay perfectly still. Um, and you might even have to hold your breath for some scans with not, not everybody can do. Um, and finally, it's very expensive. It's a huge uh, complex installation. You kind of have to build the building around the MRI. Um, and because of that, it's, um, it has very low worldwide access. I've heard anecdotally that um, uh, there's more MRIs in New York City than there are in some countries. Um, and so it can be very difficult to access. And that's uh, part of what the open source imaging project is trying to solve. Um, so quickly, um, your body is mostly water, which contains trillions of protons in the hydrogen atoms. Um, and each proton acts as a tiny little magnet um, and they're all randomly arranged. Um, so when we put you inside the magnet, the magnetic field is extending in along the long axis of the bore um, and it causes all the protons to align. Um, and it also causes them to precess. Um, and that is like a gyroscope um, spinning around uh, the Earth's uh, gravitational field. So when you apply an external force, um, the, the magnets start to wobble uh, like a gyroscope. Um, and that can emit radio signals because they're tiny little spinning charges. Um, and, but they're all out of phase, so they're not doing anything useful yet. Um, so what we do is we apply a radio frequency pulse um, at 90 degrees to the scanner axis and um, it uh, tips all the protons 90 degrees, and it also causes them to line up in phase. So now the signal starts adding up. Um, and then we listen to the signal with the, radio, with the RF coils, um, and that's the, the, the MRI signal. Um, but we still don't have any spatial information. We don't know where the signal is coming from. So we can do uh, what's called uh, NMR, or nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy. And we can look at the chemical composition of the, the signal by looking at the frequency uh, spectrum of the signal. Um, but we don't have enough information to make uh, a, an image yet because um, we have no spatial information. Um, and nuclear magnetic, re re nuclear magnetic resonance refers to the nucleus of the hydrogen uh, proton. So it's not anything uh, radioactive. Um, and they dropped the, the word nuclear for obvious reasons, um, and especially to differentiate between CT and CAT scans because there, there is no radiation in MRI. Um, so in order to get the spatial information, we add more coils, um, which are called gradient coils. And a gradient um, just means a slope. Um, so, uh, and what they do is they tip the magnetic field and cause the magnet magnetic field to vary in a known way and this affects the frequency that the protons will resonate at. And by doing that, we can, the, we can cause a known frequency dependence on position because we're varying the spatial magnetic field in a known way. Um, and that's how we get spatial information. Um, and the gradients are very fast switching, really high current um, uh, electromagnet coils. Um, and because of the, the fast switching, they cause a mechanical vibration and the scanner is kind of shaped like a speaker. And that's where the classic MRI sound comes from. Um, and then finally, uh, we acquire the images in what's called a Fourier, uh, Fourier space or K space um, or frequency space. Um, and so the final step is image reconstruction where we apply a Fourier transform um, to convert the frequency space to, uh, to an image. Um, how are we doing on time? Um, so this is some early MRI. Um, I would be remiss because I know there's a lot of connections uh, between Hope and SUNY Stony Brook. So uh, one of the early pioneers, uh, Paul Lauterbur, won the Nobel Prize. Um, and if this doesn't look like a hacker lab to you, um, I, think, I think he also deserves an honorary uh, hacker prize. Um, and then there was another one, um, uh, another guy at Stony Brook um, who developed one of the first superconducting magnets and did the first human MRI. Um, and this looks terrifying. Um, we don't wrap you in coils anymore like that. Um, we might lay coils on top of you, but our coils, I promise, are much better insulated than that. 
Um, the magnetic fields were, you know, a very low field between 500 to 1,000 Gauss, which is a measurement of the uh, strength of the magnetic field. Um, and this is the first uh, human MRI um, in 1977. And you can see the lungs, the air doesn't uh, make any signal, but you can kind of see the tissue surrounding the lungs. Um, and this is a year later. And they tried to segment some of the organs, um, the stomach and the spleen and the lungs. Um, and as you can see, we've uh, come quite a long way since then. Um, and this one took four and a half hours to make because they had to move the, the, the volunteer um, uh, to acquire every single pixel in the image because it had a fixed magnetic field and it didn't have the gradients. So they actually had to move the subject throughout the field of view in order to get uh, the image. Um, so this guy might look familiar to some of you. Um, so we measure modern MRIs in Tesla, um, which is equal to 10,000 Gauss. So they're quite a bit stronger. Um, the average junkyard magnet is about one Tesla. And it's you know hundreds of times stronger than your refrigerator magnet and tens of thousands of times the Earth's magnetic field. Um, low field is generally less than one Tesla and high field is uh, seven to 12 Tesla for human imaging. Um, the most common ones are one and a half or three Tesla. And then other uh, research NMR magnets can go from 20 to 40 Tesla. And I think the most powerful is uh, uh, 45 Tesla, uh, but those are not for humans. Um, so the magnets, there's different shapes. These are what are called open MRIs um, and they gen generally tend to be lower field strength um, and they're not as common as the, the solenoid or cylindrical magnet. Um, so this is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and this is the main, uh, the B0 axis or the main axis of the magnetic field um, is this arrow. So it's that right down the center of the scanner or the bore. Um, so this is a map of the magnetic field and how it falls off as you get away from the magnet. And it falls off pretty quickly because of uh, active shielding. Um, and you see the, the red and the yellow zones, but those don't matter. The, what matters is the five Gauss line or the 0.5 millitesla line, which is this dotted line out here. Um, and that's what we call the danger zone. Um, and you try to build the building so that the, the five Gauss line is contained within the room, but that doesn't always happen. Um, and again, the B0 axis is pointing along the center of the MRI. Um, the, MR, the magnetic field extends in three dimensions, so it actually goes above and below the floor too. So you have to be really careful. Um, and again, this is why the, the whole building has to be taken to, in, in, into account. Um, this is an MRI guided surgical suite um, and they actually painted the floor so that the, they, they mark the five Gauss line. Um, and so this is the, the MRI danger zone and the white zone. And then the blue floor is where it's like safe. But I'm sure anybody that works in here has to be like very, very careful and there's probably a lot of training that goes into this so they don't uh, make mistakes. Um, so the dangers from the magnet are the force or, or the missile effects uh, due, to the magnetic, due to the magnetic field. Um, and that's why you can't bring any uh, ferrous, uh, ferrous metal into the room because it'll just fly into the magnet. Um, and then there's also a torque. So any elongated objects will try to align themselves with the magnetic field. Um, and it can, um, it can apply hundreds of times uh, an object's weight in force. So it's, it's pretty dangerous. Um, there's also a force due to induced currents, which we talked about with the camera earlier. So even, any, even if it's not magnetic, any conductive material um, will, when you're moving it through the magnetic field, will induce a current which opposes, uh, creates its own magnetic field which opposes the force. So it's a very weird uh, uh, feeling. Um, so the magnet is always on. Um, this is what happens if you're not careful. Um, so don't do that. Um, the, that's why they divide the, the building into uh, restricted access zones. Um, and I'm looking at all you pen testers right now. Um, do, do, do these signs also apply to you? And if, if you don't believe that, um, I'm sure the magnet will be happy to uh, confiscate your lockpicks for you in a maybe violent way. So, you know, respect the signs. Um, this is a, a ultrasound cart that they use for some procedure. And they actually tied, I don't know if you can see, there's a cable here tied to the wall. Um, so it can't go past this line. So that's kind of interesting. Um, the MRI is inside a Faraday cage because the, the RF signals are, uh, that your body emits um, from your protons are very, very weak. So we try to block out as much uh, external RF noise as possible, um, including special doors with RF seals and special glass with a, a mesh in it to, that's also uh, conductive. Um, and then, uh, so how do we get wires in and out for the sensors? Um, we either use a patch panel um, and you have to be, you have to pay a lot of attention to grounding and shielding, which my, you know, past life as a, a live sound engineer actually prepared me quite well for. Um, or you can use the waveguide and pass things through the waveguide because this is just a pipe. Um, ideally, uh, we always use shielded cables uh, because of the RF concerns. 
Um, and ideally, you would avoid running them through the waveguide because the, the shield can act as an antenna and transmit uh, RF noise from outside to inside the room. And that's a problem. Um, this one, I believe, is fiber. And fiber is actually OK because it's, it's not metallic at all. Um, so that a lot of uh, commercially available MRI sensors uh, use fiber, um, but that's like very, very expensive. Um, we also have to use cable traps because the shields can heat up. Um, and so the cable trap helps block uh, what's called eddy currents um, that build up from the RF pulse um, and uh, block that from uh, 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 causing heating in the cable. But that can actually cause like serious burns. So that's something that we have to be really, really careful about. Um, don't, don't be this guy. Um, so the magnet is actually a superconductor. Um, and uh, superconducting means it has uh, zero resistance. Um, and they use uh, fancy uh, uh, wire filaments um, that when you get them below a certain temperature, which is very, very low, um, they become superconducting and they lose their resistance. Um, the magnet, the reason the magnet is so big is it's actually a giant tank of liquid helium, which is held at four Kelvin and it's cryogenically cooled. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, uh, to achieve the superconducting. Um, so the, the, it's pretty complicated. It's called a cryostat. And it has very uh, elaborate uh, thermal shielding. Um, this is a this is a an an, an NMR magnet, um, which has a very small bore. It's just this tube at the top here. So this is for like measuring chemical samples and stuff. Um, this one actually has an inner chamber with liquid nitrogen to keep it even colder. So this one's probably a pretty high field. Um, but there's like many many layers of thermal insulation to keep the magnet cold. Um, so when you inject the current into the magnet, um, you inject the current once when you, when you start the magnet, and then you walk away, and there's no power source, and the current just keeps flowing forever. So have we you know, magically discovered perpetual motion? Um, not quite. So there is a very small resistance, and the magnet does actually get weaker over time, but it's a very, very small amount. And over the lifespan of the magnet, it's pretty negligible. Um, and there, are th there is energy going into the system, uh, mostly with the chilling. Um, you're pumping the hel uh, liquid helium. Um, so there's electrical energy and heat energy. And you also refill the liquid helium periodically. So um, sorry, there's no free lunch. Um, the magnetic field has to be very, very even, or what we call B0 uniformity, which is those maps I showed earlier. Um, and because the frequency of the RF signal depends on the magnet, uh, the strength of the magnet. Um, so if we just use one big coil, um, we only get a very small uh, area of homogeneity in the center, and that's not big enough for imaging. So by using multiple coils, we can expand that range um, into a much wider area. And so the, the, uh, the magnet coils are pretty complicated designs. Um, and then we actually add uh, additional superconducting coils called shim coils that are active, and they're, they're automatically adjusted by the, the, the computer before every scan. And that helps us get the, the uh, homogeneity uh, very even, because when you go into the scanner, your protons are interacting with the magnetic field. And so just your presence uh, or any, any presence in the magnet will disrupt the magnetic field. Um, so you have to do the active shimming before every scan. Um, and there's another set of uh, superconducting coils going in the opposite direction. Um, and those are the active shielding coils, which help uh, block the magnetic field from, uh, or it helps contain the magnetic field to a smaller area. But it has the secondary effect that the magnetic, magnetic field increases very quickly as you approach the magnet. So for what I do, we have to be extremely careful when we're testing new objects, because they could just fly out of your hand like nothing. Um, so the, the magnetic field aligns all your spins. Um, I think I have to go through this part pretty quickly. Um, it, it aligns the spins of all your protons, um, and it causes them to process like a gyroscope. So this should be spinning. Um, and the frequency that they uh, process at is called the Larmor frequency. Um, and it depends on the magnetic field strength and what's called the gyromagnetic ratio of the particle um, gamma. And uh, all the particles have different uh, ratios. Um, so they all uh, will resonate at different frequencies. Um, so the Larmor frequency, we call that the resonance frequency or the center frequency of the scanner because that's where all the RF equipment is tuned to. Um, and the frequency is equal to the gyromagnetic ratio times the strength of the magnetic field. Um, and for hydrogen protons, um, this is the gyromagnetic ratio. Um, and you can see how the frequency changes at different scanner strengths. And it, the frequency goes up with uh, scanner strength. Um, generally, SNR tends to go up uh, with the magnet strength as well. Um, so this is the uh, NMR spectroscopy. This is a frequency spectrum. And you can see how different um, molecules 
uh, resonate at different frequencies and you can look at the chemical composition of uh, your, your sample. Um, and uh, one cool uh, application of that is to detect uh, counterfeit olive oil. Um, so, um, uh, so what we do is we hit the, the protons with a, a RF pulse, uh, which is, uh, also has a magnetic component, and we call that the B1 field. Um, uh, and it's actually, because it's an oscillating radio signal, it's rotating around the scanner at the same frequency as the protons are precessing. Um, and it's always at 90 degrees rotating, and it knocks the protons 90 degrees uh, um, away from the B0 axis. Um, and now they start emitting radio signals. Um, and then um, it also uh, lines them all up in phase, and that's how we get the signal, because otherwise they would be all randomly aligned and we wouldn't get anything. Um, and this is what the signal looks like. Um, so as soon as you turn the RF pulse off, um, you get uh, the signal starts to decay. So you can see it oscillating at the Larmor frequency, and then it's decaying um, back towards alignment with the B0 field. Um, and this is what we call a T2 effect. Uh, I'm sorry. This is what we call a T1 effect, and then a T2 effect um, is the dephasing of the protons also causes the signal to decay. Um, and this follows what's called the block equations, um, which are uh, T1 and T2 are the relax and relaxation time constants, and those go into exponential functions. Um, and so T1 is how quickly it realigns with the, the B0 field, and T2 is how fast the protons dephase. And T1 is a lot faster than T2. And we can adjust the scanner parameters um, to get different tissue contrast because um, T1 and T2 are fundamental properties of uh, different molecules, just like uh, mass or uh, density. Um, so we have all kinds of different RF coils. Um, and uh, uh, today's imaging is a lot of parallel imaging. So we might have 12 coils or you know, 64 coils in one uh, what we call head coil. And we want to get the coils as close as possible so that because the signal is very weak that is coming from your body. Um, so they might, instead of wrapping a coil around you, they might lay it on top of you like this. Um, and the straps are uh, just to keep the coil from shifting during the scan. So that's not nothing to be afraid of. Um, and there's a lot of uh, research coils that, and they can be as simple as a wire loop um, or they can be like fairly complex. Um, this is for uh, multi-nuclear imaging um, or uh, it, it can be uh, tuned, the tuning can be adjusted to different molecules. And so it's not just pro uh, hydrogen protons. Um, there's also flexible coils. So if you have pain in your wrist, um, but it only hurts when you flex your wrist. Um, maybe we can see why, uh, but we can't do that with a rigid coil. Um, so a lot of people are working on uh, flexible coils so you can get images in both positions and see the difference. Um, this is kind of cool. It's an a OpenCV uh, hack to uh, use a QR code to track a RF probe and you can look at the, the uh, uh, field uh, from the coil. Um, so the gradient coils uh, for the spatial localization are really complicated. They have these really crazy fingerprint shapes. Um, they're, uh, they are not superconducting. They're electromagnetic coils, um, but they are liquid cools because they, uh, they have very high current and uh, uh, voltage, and they're uh, switching very fast. So both the coils and the amplifiers are liquid cooled. Um, and this is, again, what causes vibration of the scanner, and that's where the, um, the MRI noise comes from. Um, the magnetic gradients, so the, the B0 field in the magnet, if we're looking along uh, the uh, one axis of the magnet, the B0 field is ideally very linear and very even. Um, and because of the Larmor equation, uh, the frequency that the protons are processing at should be the same in all regions. Um, so that's not helpful for creating an image because we, we can't tell if the protons come from here or from here. So what we do is we apply a slope to the magnetic field um, and we change by, by doing that um, because of the frequency dependence. Now the, the Larmor equation has a dependence on position. So now the particles over here are going to process at a lower frequency. And here they're still at the center frequency because we're crossing zero. And here they're at a higher frequency. And now we can look at the frequency spectrum of the RF signal. And now we have spatial localization. Um, and that's, that's the trick. That's called frequency encoding. Um, and you. By doing this, we can uh, select a slice with one gradient. Um, I'm going to go through these quickly. Um, and we apply different gradients in different directions to get the spatial lo localization, because we have a three-dimensional problem. So we have three gradients to solve it. Um, and the, um, the phase encoding gradient uh, has to be repeated multiple times. And that's where we uh, manipulate the, spin, the, the phase angle of the protons to get additional uh, uh, spatial information. But that has to be repeated many times to fill up the image. And that's why the MRI takes so long. 
Um, and by adjusting uh, the, the, the timing of the scanner, we can get different image contrasts. Um, and you can see how uh, here, um, these are T1 weighted and T2 weighted. These are all the same sample, so they all look the same. Um, this is copper sulfate. These are Lego uh, pieces that they machined, uh, custom made Lego pieces machined as fluid chambers. I thought that was really cool. Um, and uh, here the oil is brighter, the, the copper sulfate and the oil are brighter in T1, um, but the, the oil, uh, the, the copper sulfate doesn't show up at all in T2, um, but the, the oil does, and then the water is brighter than the oil in T2. So by adjusting the, the image weightings, you can uh, uh, you can get different imaging contrasts, which are have different diagnostic purposes for the doctor. And you might do multiple scans. You might do a T1 and a T2. Uh, uh, you might do other ones, because um, they each have different information. Um, I'm going to skip through a little bit of this. Um, so we acquire the image in K space, um, which is frequency space, and the, it's a grid, like a matrix on a computer um, or a, a 2D array. Um, and we uh, acquire this, the, the frequency information, and we acquire one line at a time uh, using the gradients. And so that this is why it's slow, and you have to fill up every line. And this might be like a 256 by 256 matrix. So we have to repeat the pulse sequence 256 times to get one slice. Um, and then we do the inverse Fourier transform to convert the frequency space, which doesn't look like anything, to the actual image. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Fourier transform, if you're familiar with sound, um, you can look at the low frequencies and the high frequencies um, given the time signal of the, of the, of the sound. And um, you, know, you can boost the bass or you can boost the high frequencies. Um, but th this is the FFT right here, is uh, dividing a time or a spatial signal into frequencies. Um, So uh, this is what the fully reconstructed image looks like. Most of the information is contained in the center of K-space. So if we ignore the outer part of K-space, I don't know if you can see, but the rest of it is grayed out. Um, you get the low frequency. And now this we're talking about spatial frequency. So the, the, the black and white uh, variation uh, uh, in the image. Um, if, we, if we ignore all the... Uh, if we only look at the center of K-space, we get a low frequency image, which is kind of blurry, but you see all the structures. And if we ignore the center of K-space, we lose the structure, but we get all the high frequency details. Um, so access is a big problem in MRI. Um, we used to talk about portable scanners, and we what, what they meant was a tractor, tractor trailer um, with an MRI in the back. Um, and this is actually like uh, what's used in a lot of more rural locations. Um, they might have like a truck you know, pulled up to the side of the hospital that's permanently wired in. Um, and so what... Um, now there's uh, uh, more portable magnets uh, nowadays. Um, these, this one, I'm not sure if it's portable or not, um, but this one is portable. You can push it around the hospital um, and it has this really funny um, uh, 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 ba barrier so you don't get too close to it because it has a permanent magnet. Um, so uh, the technology is really uh, advancing rapidly, um, but again, like MRI is also very expensive. Um, so this is where open source imaging comes in. Um, so it started, I don't know exactly when it started, but one of the earliest projects was in 2014, and they were trying to build a tabletop uh, educational scanner uh, for less than $10,000, because you could buy it commercially for a lot of money. Um, this has a one centimeter field of view um, with 50 ppm uh, hom homogeneity and a 0.19 Tesla permanent magnet. Um, and you might have uh, several of these in a classroom, um, so you want to keep the cost down. Um, right now, the open source imaging project is working on a fully open source MRI that can be used for human imaging on a smaller scale. So maybe like a limb or a head or something like that. Um, and they're actually seeking regulatory approval right now for human imaging. Um, and this is uh, uh, what's called a Halbach array, where you use tiny little uh, neodymium magnets and you put them in these little square slots. And this is a CNC machine. Um, and it creates, by, by putting all the magnets in a, in a very specific arrangement, uh, which you need a com computer simulation to design, um, you can get a very homogeneous uh, low field magnet. So this is like a mini MRI scan, uh, magnet. Um, and they also added uh, shims uh, with sliding trays so you can uh, uh, fix the magnetic field even better. Um, this is one of my favorite projects on open source imaging. Um, it's basically like uh, the same as a 3D printer, but they put a magnetic probe on the end um, so they can measure the homogeneity of the magnet um, and create that B0 map that we saw earlier. Um, and this, this is, uh, um, uh, do, do not try this at home. And that's as much of a warning for me as it is for you, because this is where I got that idea to try the stepper motor. Because I was like, oh, maybe I can 
uh, put a stepper motor in the MRI room. Um, so yeah, do not try this at home. Um, but yeah, it was great for ideas for me. Um, so you have to be extremely careful doing something like this. They put a really long rod on the end um, because they can't put this close to the magnet because it would just, it would fly in and get stuck and hurt someone. Um, this is a 3T, 3T magnet and this is a, a 7T magnet. So this one you have to be even more careful in. Um, and, but it's, you know, it's, it's a really cool idea. And I never would have thought it, you know, especially being new to the field, I never would have thought it would have been okay to do this. But as long as you're super careful and you have the proper training, you know, you can, you know, it's pretty interesting um, what you can do. Um, there's all kinds of RF uh, amplifiers projects on there. So there's a lot of hardware projects. Um, there's a lot of software projects and SDR projects. Um, SDR is opening up like all kinds of new, new possibilities. Um, and there's plenty of open source software on the project too. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved, opensourceimaging.org, um, they're always looking for help and collaborators. Um, and uh, there's some great uh, talks on um, uh, MRI Together conference is uh, all the talks are available on YouTube. And there's a really interesting talk from the National uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory um, that shows the relation between um, MRI and radio astronomy. And that's also really interesting. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. All right, thank you. Uh, if anyone has any questions, he can't hear you directly, but I can try and repeat them or we can go up to the, if you wanna go up to the front mic, you can speak directly in, whichever you prefer. Yeah, I'll do my best. Without a high B0 homogeneity, what is lost in the image is the question. Um, so going back to the Larmor equation, um, we get the spatial information from the frequency that the, um, the protons are, are uh, processing at. Um, and so we need the gradients to be very linear um, so that we have a known, um, oops, where do we go? Um, we need the gradients to be very linear because the frequency has a direct dependence on the, on the magnet strength. So if there's any variation in the, in the magnetic field, then this line will get really funky and then we can't tell where the, the, the signals are coming from anymore. All right, thank you. Another question? Yeah. Is there anything you can share with us about Libra Hub? Uh, I'm not sure what that is, I'm sorry. No. Okay. Uh, one more question. Hello, I'm Xander. Thanks for the talk. Um, I, I actually get a full body MRI every year um, through a company in the San Francisco Bay Area called QBio. And as you said, it takes about 50 minutes to do the scan. And uh, I'm curious, is there any kind of physics based impossibility proof around that time? Or could we conceivably do this in five minutes uh, through some hardware innovations? Uh, there are a lot of hardware bounds on what's possible. Um, it's basically how fast can you get your gradients. Um, and there is a physical limitation on that because as the gradients get more powerful and uh, as the switching gets faster, it actually induces um, what's called peripheral nerve stimulation. And it can cause like tingling in your arms. It's not dangerous as far as I'm aware. Um, but it's you know very unpleasant for the patient. Um, so the, the the speed of the gradients is a big problem, and the speed of the gradients depends uh, uh, directly on how fast we can acquire the, the images. You can actually, if you're if you're getting an MRI, I've heard people that have been doing this a lot longer than I have. Uh, if you listen to the sounds, it can actually tell which type of uh, pulse sequence is being run uh, at, at by the sound it makes. Excellent, thank you. We have one question from our matrix chat. From Odd Creation, you were, you were comparing accelerometer-based measurements with cameras as the baseline. What's the advantage compared to cameras? Um, the camera was uh, kind of a secondary thing because um, uh, I, I am very like I have a background in computer vision, so I'm really interested in doing and using cameras for tracking. Um, but we were just do, using the camera to verify um, the signal from the accelerometer because we can't program the patient's motion. The, po the patient can move in any direction at any time. So the, the camera was uh, the only thing I could think of, because if we, if we had a, a sensor that could do this already in the, in the MRI, then we wouldn't need, then I wouldn't need to, to do my job in the first place. Um, so the fact that those sensors don't exist now is what we're working on. Um, so the camera was just to verify it because we can't, um, we, have no, uh, we have no ground truth for patient motion. 
Excellent. We have one more question from the Matrix chat. From uh, what are the image formats like? Can I make a 3D model of my own data without proprietary software? Yes. Um, there, it's called DICOM format, and there's something called PyDICOM in Python. Um, and yeah, you should be able to import uh, DICOM images. Um, and uh, I'm not as familiar with that side of it, but uh, that sh should definitely be possible. There's also plenty of free uh, DICOM viewers online. There's a, a program called 3D Slicer that can also import DICOMs. Excellent. We got one more question for you. Regarding the, down, the brown screen for correcting slication motion, could that be taken, could that be corrected for by overlapping your slices, or are the slices being professionally small that you can't properly fit? And you have to treat with the, I'm not sure treat is the right word, but the face is removed between the slices. Wow. <laughs> we'll try. Uh, we? I, he I heard it. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so each slice is acquired one at a time. There is, there is uh, I, I went through the very, the most basic format for this, but um, uh, there is what's called 3D imaging now, and I'm not really familiar with how it works, but you can acquire a 3D image in one scan, uh, as far as I understand. Um, but the, because of the, the limitations on the gradient speeds and how fast we can acquire the slices, if there's any, mo like even a heartbeat motion uh, can throw it off. And it's also like the motion of your, the um, blood through your veins has a magnetic field. So even that has an effect. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not answering your question, though. Thank you so much for the talk, Doug. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for the audience for being here. Uh, yeah, thanks, everyone. A and if Doug has any information or documents he wants to share, the presentation, you should be able to find it. He can post the Matrix chat for this talk, and you will be able to see it there. Uh, come back at 3 o'clock. Our next talk will be Secure Cell Phone Communication, Mission Accomplished or Popular Delusion by Dr. Nick Germain. So we hope to see you here in 10 minutes.